Peter Janetta, and I have a very happy choice of things to do today, and that is to have a conversation for posterity with Theodore Kersey. There have been many advances in medicine and in neurosurgery which have been important, and you can think of them all. Premier among these advances which have changed my life and changed yours as a neurosurgeon and change the lives of our patients has been the application of the binocular surgical microscope to neurosurgery. We're privileged today to have Dr. Kersey with us to talk about the background, his background, that got him into neurosurgery following his educational process before that, and the background that, that made someone go ahead with a then daring, innovative application of technology. Ted, how did, how did this all start? What happened to you as a child and a, a kid to get you uh, into medicine and so forth? Where did you go to school? Well, my father was a Christian scientist. That was a good start. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I attended uh, school. In, I was born and raised in New York, lived on Long Island, uh, attended uh, uh, Sawanica, a local high school, uh, concentrated in playing lacrosse and uh, moved on to Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland, where I was a pre-med. And uh, from there, I went to Long Island, what was then called Long Island College of Medicine. Did your father support you through this? No, I sort of worked my way through. All right, so you were going against family uh, he, tradition by being a Christian, he, uh, uh, which was Christian science. He was hurt pretty badly in the Depression. And uh, in addition to that, he was not really enthusiastic about medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, he also attended uh, high school in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, he had the view that, uh, and I'm trying to think of the man's name, who, um, the guy who did the uh, report on medicine in 1911. Louis Flexner. Flexner, the Flexner report. You know, mm -hmm. Flexner was my father's high school teacher exactly. before he got started. And uh, Flexner had a very dim view. Abraham of, Flexner. Abraham was Flexner was yes. his father. That's yeah. right. Yeah. He had a very dim view of graduate education of any kind. And uh, my father liked to say that college was a four-year loaf on the old man's dough. <laughs> and uh, he uh, generously gave me an opportunity to start the freshman year. And then mm -hmm. he said, if you want to stay in college, and he said, figure out a way to do it. And what did you do? Well, I attended bar, and I uh, tested milk, and uh, I ran a time clock uh, four hours every night, and, uh, and I also had a scholarship in chemistry as an assistant, which covered my tuition. So I sort of just slid through, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. managed to graduate in three years because we were all accelerated as a result of the war, right. and uh, then started medical school at Long Island College of Medicine in Brooklyn. Uh, which is now called SUNY Downstate uh, Medical Branch or something like right, that. Right. Um, and uh, my fir I was asked uh, by Dr. Selby what was my first encounter with a neurosurgeon. And, uh, in those days, the first year, most many of you will remember, many not, the first uh, year of medical school consisted of a body, a book, and a lecture a week. And, uh, we spent all of our time in the lab. Uh, uh, we had a thing called a clinical correlation conference at 4 o'clock every Friday afternoon, uh, at which time we met a real doctor, a guy with an MD degree who did something in medicine. And uh, we were, uh, we didn't get an awful lot out of that, but the fact that we weren't in the lab for two hours <laughs> was the best part of it. We considered it sort of like recess. And we were sitting at the amphitheater in Long Island College of Medicine waiting for our clinical correlation conference. Mm -hmm. My roommate and I were sharing a box of Cracker Jacks. We weren't exactly a professional looking group. And uh, the professor who was assigned to talk to us that day was our old Browder, Jeff Browder, Jefferson Browder, uh, who was chairman of neurosurgery at Long Island. He was a very impressive guy. He came in the room and uh, he had on a cravat and a, a lovely looking uh, scrub jacket with a monogram on the collar. He, was, he really looked pretty neat. He looked at us with a fair amount of disdain. 
thought it was ridiculous that he should be bothered talking to freshman medical students, said so, and uh, informed us of our overall ignorance, of which we were pretty sure of. And uh, he said, for example, what do you know about the parts of speech? It turned out that my uh, roommate, uh, Robert Kimball, uh, had discontinued his graduate uh, program in comparative philology to attend medical school. And he was sort of a smart ass like me <laughs> and said, well, in what language? And uh, Jeff Browder said, well, in any language. And, uh, so my roommate uh, climbed over the fence in the amphitheater. And, and it was a 180 degree blackboard. Um, he got the chalk. And he covered the whole 180 degree blackboard with a, uh, a description of the parts of speech in Sanskrit, Proto Hindustani, uh, Hebrew, Latin, Greek, French, you name it. He just did it. He got all the way around the end of the blackboard. It was filled with his uh, uh, writing. And he walked over to Dr. Browder. It took about 30 minutes. Browder never over, interrupted him. He just never interrupted. Just went right on through. And whatever Dr. Browder says, or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> At which time Jeff Browder <laughs> shook his head and walked out of the room. That was yeah. That was my first oh, encounter great. with neurosurgery, and mm -hmm. I remembered neurosurgery mm -hmm. as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, uh, we shared a garret with uh, Malcolm Carpenter, who, as you know, became the author of uh, Carpenter and Truax. And uh, Fred Mettler was our uh, instructor in, uh, in neuroanatomy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this was sort of an early background about neurology and the brain. Mal Carpenter didn't believe there was another organ in the body except the brain, I think, from the, right from the beginning on. So he was a so, savant about the brain early. Oh, early yeah. And, but and did we that, just did talked that turn about you on? the brain Did that turn you oh, on? Oh, yeah. I just, and it was so difficult to learn. Was he a classmate? <laughs> he was a classmate, right, and we right. shared a room. He was a roommate mm -hmm, virtually. Mm -hmm. And then how about further neurosurgery in, in medical school? Did you get further well, exposure to Browder uh, and to those uh, people? I had uh, very little exposure. Uh, the, in the, uh, a, the senior resident talked to us uh, one time in the third year about um, there was a clinic, and he showed us a patient with a brain abscess. And it was an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed. Mm -hmm. I don't remember his name. Uh, I tried to watch a brain operation. And I went up there, put on the clothes, went into the room, and the whole operation was way up in the air. They were on boxes, and the patient was elevated. Now, why they were up so high in the sky, I don't know. And all I could see was feet and knees and one thing or another, and uh, that was my knowledge of what neurosurgery was all about. And uh, that ended that, and then uh, in my, I had sort of a catastrophic experience in my senior year mm -hmm. uh, in that I was married uh, between the third and fourth year and the night we got back from our honeymoon. We also graduated from medical school in three years because of the war. It was a totally accelerated yes. program yes. with a long weekend between years only. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got back from my honeymoon, I went to check and see whether or not I had any, what I had to do when I started the next year. And it turned out I was supposed to uh, present the case to Emil Getsch, who was then chairman of surgery. And uh, I got down there about 7 o'clock at night, realized I had to present. And it was a patient with a parathyroid adenoma, a young boy who had had pathological fractures. And, uh, you know, it's a disturbing. Was, and in those days, a parathyroid adenoma, I guess, was a pretty way out sort of thing with all the metabolic changes. So I went ahead and memorized all the metabolic changes and the significance of the calcium and phosphorus metabolism. And the next day at the conference, uh, Emil Gatch asked me how many parathyroid glands there were, and I told him two. And that was the wrong <laughs> answer. <laughs> and after a very bad tongue lashing, I was left the thing bleeding. I knew that I was in trouble. And in those days, we didn't have the boards for graduating. We had a pass, surgery, pediatrics, OB, sure, medicine. Sure. And it was a star chamber examination. And, uh, so I had eight weeks of surgery, and I knew I was in trouble right from the start. I don't think you were somehow, yeah, but go and ahead. I, and I thought that I was scared. Sure. <laughs> and uh, here I was uh, married with responsibilities, and it uh, looked like maybe I was going to be a jo soda jerk if, <laughs> if I got walked out. 
So I worked very hard, and I knew a lot about surgery. Mm -hmm. And at the Star Chamber, uh, I, uh, I did okay with Getch. And uh, the next day in my mailbox, I had a little note inviting me to become a member of the House staff. There so that go. was a kind of a positive thing. But you didn't do that. I didn't do it, no, because, not? well, it was a period of time in which it was very, you know, specialization was a very new thing. We're very about controversial. 1946, 1947, okay. uh, and even, well, that would be actually 1945. Okay. And uh, people said, well, you shouldn't specialize. That's the wrong thing to do. And a lot of people, there was a, a school of medicine known as neo -Hippocratism. And that was that you could specialize once you became competent as a general practitioner. That was the first requirement. So I went off and took an internship in Phoenix, Arizona, which is the only place I could get one. There weren't very many rotating internships at that time. Oh, you wanted a rotating internship. Yeah, and I changed my mind. I did mm -hmm. this. I'd already been accepted. I did this much too late. I see. And I got there a rotating no, intern. no match at that time. So no, know, right? no match. Right. No. Right. And uh, I went to uh, Phoenix, uh, Arizona, for this rotating internship. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was uh, that was that was really uh, quite an experience, and and I started in the emergency room. I had only been there a couple of weeks, and uh, John Green had just come from the late John Green, whom we both know well, uh, knew well. Uh, John came from uh, Chicago, Eric Oberg and Percival Bailey, and mm -hmm. at that time that was one of the real in places to learn about neurosurgery. And he had a lot of ideals and so on. And, uh, I didn't know him. I didn't. He. He. I just started in the emergency room, and he had just gotten on the staff of the hospital. He hadn't been there very long, a week or two. Mm -hmm. And a man came into the emergency room with a head injury. While he was in the emergency room, dilated a pupil, uh, lucid interval, contralateral hemiplegia. I called uh, John Green, and he was on his way to or from or something. He said, I'll be right there, but don't wait. Get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I took him in the operating room. I had seen a bone flap turn. I'd seen a movie of turning a bone flap. I knew what side it was on, and I went in the operating room, and I was a little faster, I guess, than they thought I would ever be. And uh, by the time <laughs> John arrived, <laughs> I was drilling the holes <laughs> and putting in a bone flap. <laughs> Not exactly the right thing to do, but the clot had come out of the burr hole. So oh, you got, anyway, we got the guy, got it out, That's and great. somehow got through it. And, and John was very kind. I didn't do the right thing, and he I did the right thing. He, he well, did I did the right thing, sure. but I had no idea. And uh, uh, I was particularly impressed with his um, sense of reasoning. He took the house staff through every step for everything. And I just really worshiped the ground he walked on. And so that kind of aimed me even further to neurosurgery. And I applied to Columbia, Montreal, I don't remember, three or four places, and was turned down flat. Uh, and then I heard about uh, a opening of the residency program in Los Angeles. And in those days, uh, there was Sautel Veterans Hospital Los Angeles County, under the direction of Carl Rand. Phil Vogel, I do not believe, had a, a, a certified training program. The program at County was certified and had been for a long time. That was Carl Rand also. That was Carl Rand. But then UCLA, the Veterans Hospital was sort of an offshoot. And I don't even know if they were certified. I think they were applying or they, it was sort of the feeder system for the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I got into the program. And uh, I started there, and I remember uh, my first encounter with Carl Rand. Uh, Bob Rand, whom we both know and collaborated with, was uh, at the same point in training at Ann Arbor with uh, Max Peach. Sure. And I remember Carl Rand saying to me, uh, well, I'm going to keep my eye on you because I'll be able to figure out where my son is in the world of neurosurgery if I use you as a marker. We became close people. Uh, during the residency, anything that, that I, I, one of the things that I think was monumental 
in my thinking about being a neurosurgeon. And that was that we decided to operate or to not operate and what we were going to do based very largely on the neurological examination. And we now know that that's not quite as helpful and we understand much more about it now. But the imaging was terrible. We were not doing angiograms. Uh, we were doing air studies with ventriculograms sure. and making big decisions on whether the third ventricle was tilted or whether it wasn't tilted and so on. It was pretty, pretty crude. But we went to so much work to open the nervous system. The drills, the absence of power, <coughs> equipment, mm -hmm. and so on were such that and then we get to look at the nervous system, you know, the spinal cord or the brain, and God, it was disappointing. I mean, we thought of it from the neurological context of all the wires and the pathways. And <coughs> all of our deductions were based on this paradigm of this big thing. Mm -hmm. And then you worked a couple of hours, and you got down there and looked at it, and it was a very great disappointment because the decisions that you made in the operating room really couldn't be related to what it had been related to your aunt's idea of anatomy and physiology, because it was just a tiny little thing down there that you had to fiddle around with, you and you couldn't thing. see. You learn one thing at one level, and you were really dealing at another level. That's right. You did all your and thinking and cogitating at one level. All of a sudden, you found yourself at another level, and, 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 and the two were not easily related was to it disappointing where it was very disappointing were results disappointing it was very disappointing the results were disappointing how did you stand it I mean the two or three patients with acoustic tumor that I first scrubbed on mm -hmm. died mm -hmm. uh, and then I learned that that was about the na that 40 percent mortality was pretty much the national sure. average okay. this was frightening did you think of leaving I, neurosurgery while you yes were I did Why? I left neurosurgery and went in the Army. I volunteered for the Army. That was sort of an emotional thing. Uh, at the end of uh, the, the year at Sautel, the Veterans Hospital, uh, I was disappointed in neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. And there was no polite way out. Uh, uh, the late Secretary Forrestal called for volunteers, all of us that had been through medical school that had served no time in the Army. And I went down the day I got the telegram and volunteered. When I came back, I did mostly general surgery in the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I had a lovely exchange with Barnes Woodall when I was stationed in Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina. Uh, he was very kind to me. Uh, but uh, in, in, uh, I ended up being a general surgeon. And then I came back to county after two years in the military in Germany and so on. And. Uh, I couldn't start neurosurgery again uh, because there were people who were ahead of me. But you were, you were by law, allowed to get a job again, weren't you? Or didn't that... Uh, well, I had that been time? accepted for the program. I told Dr. Rand I didn't want to go back to the Veterans Hospital. Okay. I wanted to go to county. You know, county then was one of the largest hospitals in the world, sure. a major place, and I wanted to be where the action was. And he recognized that, and, mm -hmm. and I started there. But when I started, there was not a spot in the neurosurgical program. So you went back into general surgery? I took another year of general surgery. In the meantime, over half the neurosurgery, the general surgery residents had been drafted. So I had precocious responsibilities mm -hmm. and operating mm -hmm. room experience in general surgery. And it was so nice to look in the chest and say, oh, there's the heart, and here's the diaphragm, and here's all the things you've got to think about and work at, as compared to the neurosurgery, which, black box. which was just sort of, you know, <laughs> what are we going to do? Yeah. Yeah. And I came very close to changing t into general surgery, and I was encouraged to do so mm -hmm. by the general surgeons. And, uh, but anyway, I went back to neurosurgery. When you uh, were at uh, Southern Cal when I was a resident, you were giving the, the general surgical lectures to the that's medical right. students on belly pain, if I remember I know, correctly. That's right. So you didn't you leave right. it completely. No, I didn't leave it completely. Yeah. And, uh, but then uh, you get back into neurosurgery. Why did you do it? Well, I, can't, I, I was still fascinated, that, you know, the, the brain, and I, and I think I carried John Green as a, a role model, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I thought that probably it was a, a 
uh, more. In, I thought that we had solved the general surgical problems, and we certainly hadn't solved the neurosurgical problems. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a better career opportunity. So to my dis family's distress, I went on for three more years of okay. residency. Were you happier in it when you dumped back into it? I was really quite happy as a neurosurgical resident at County, and I mm -hmm. think it was mm -hmm. due to the fact that I was a little bit more mature. I had now been a doctor and a surgeon for three years before that, and I had a sense of... You were sort of neo-Hippocratic, weren't you? By little neo-Hippocratic, yeah. right. All right. And uh, so uh, then I, you know, I finished the, the uh, training program. Mm -hmm. I practiced in uh, private practice with uh, Rupert Rainey for a short time. How long was that? That was a year, exactly. I started in June and finished in June. And I wanted, it wasn't enough for me. And Gene Stern uh, offered me an opportunity to come to UCLA as a instructor, I think. And I went ahead and... Full-time faculty. Full-time faculty. What year was that? Uh, um, that was in, uh, uh, must have been 19, I finished uh, in 1954, 55, that was 56. Okay. I was there when they opened the UCLA Medical Center. In 57 they opened it up. I in 57. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and Gene was in charge. And Gene's only a couple years older than I am. Mm -hmm. I don't even mm -hmm. think he had his boards at that time. I don't remember for I sure. I think he did. I'm not certain. And, uh, no, I remember him going off and taking it. Oh, really? <laughs> Actually. <laughs> anyway, I stayed there a while. And uh, um, I was certainly... Uh, not, but I, I don't know what it was, but I didn't feel comfortable at UCLA. And uh, I certainly wasn't, as you well know, I've never been a very good administrator. Uh, I, you're I wouldn't, you're I improving. wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I went off into private practice and uh, ended up with Carl Rand and Henry Cuneo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was practicing at Good Samaritan Hospital. And uh, I attended a meeting where... So this was 57. Right around there, yeah. 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 And I attended a meeting with uh, Bill House, where Bill House was presenting a paper on uh, stapes mobilization, wiggling sort of thing, okay. for otosclerosis. I remember that, right. And he showed a beautiful film that would have been taken through the microscope uh, on this stapes operation. It was really neat. It was very clean. So, and, and Bill had been an intern and rotated through our service in mm -hmm. county. So I went up and congratulated Bill. I thought it was a really nice paper. And uh, he said, well, that's my brother's work. And he said, the real goal now is to get to the other side, the inner ear. And he said, we're, we're locked in because we can't, we, can't get, we can't get to the inner ear without essentially destroying the middle ear. So a day or two later, I was doing a classical Spiller-Fraser trigeminal uh, rhizotomy for trigeminal neuralgia, mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. disease you and I know about. And uh, I was lifting up the, the dura, and the, uh, we were, the patient was in the sitting position, okay. lifting the dura up and uh, looking for the meningeal and trying to say to myself, don't go too far back, don't go too far back, because the seventh, the superficial petrosal nerve right. is there. So stay forward, stay forward. And uh, I was doing this, and I thought, Wow, that's where Bill House wants to go. I didn't have any idea what he wanted to do when mm -hmm. he got there. Mm -hmm. And you were there. And I was just right down there, you know. Yeah. And I said, sure. there it is. And so I, uh, Bill and I went down to the autopsy room on a Sunday morning. And I showed, he said, oh, you're crazy. You can't, we can't do it through the head, you know. Because the ear, nose, and throat guys were terrified of anything that was near the dura. That was sort of a taboo. And I showed him this technology that we could get there. And so then we, he and I did a lot of dissections together. These are gross dissections? No, microscope. These are, okay, where did where the microscope come into that? The, were they, these cadaver dissections? These were cadaver what? dissections okay. at the county hospital. Binocular microscope. Binocular, okay. microscope, beam splitter, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, then we did, uh, you know, there are several uh, sclera... Uh, ossification centers in the otic capsule. I don't remember where they are now. Uh, and Bill had the idea that the patients with otosclerosis that had nerve deafness and didn't recover had otosclerosis on the otic capsule where the eighth nerve went through the spiral ganglion. 
And so the general idea was was to decompress that. Yeah. If it was ever an altruistic idea, that was it. And uh, we prepared ourselves for doing that, and we did it. And we did it 17 times, and uh, it didn't work. Okay. But what impressed me was that it was, all, it was an extradural operation. What really impressed me is, you know, epidural bleeding could drive you batty in those days. And we used to call it ooze. <laughs> and that was bleeding where we didn't know where it was coming from. Sure. And I noticed that when we were using the microscope and doing the extradural dissection, there was no such thing as ooze. Because you could see the blood vessel that the blood was coming the from. Arm. Yes. And I get it. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wow. And then Bill and I uh, parted company because we had some disagreement about the, the uh, trans labyrinthine procedure. What disagreement did you have? You mind telling me? Pardon? What kind of disagreement did you have? Well, <clears throat> we were pretty successful in getting into the intracranial spaces with the drilling procedure, trans labyrinthine and. Uh, so-called uh, sub-tentorial uh, extradural approach to the canal. Uh, Bill thought that he could remove acoustic tumors. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the motivations for his thinking that is he had watched me taking out acoustic tumors. And, you know, I can't blame him. <laughs> it was a pretty disappointing sort of mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, so he thought it could be done easier through the ear. And uh, I, the reason I really wouldn't, just didn't feel morally right about that was that I have been trained in general surgery and one of the rules in general surgery is you will remember you're a so-called certified general surgeon uh, was that you if you had some pathology and you had an anatomical structure you needed to protect for removing the pathology you identified the anatomical structure you wanted to protect first well, if you go in through the labyrinth, the tumor is between you and the brain stem, and the internal auditory artery, and all the other things. And that, to me, was oh, yeah. bad news. Uh -huh. And I never really did endorse that. Uh, but everything has changed. Uh, well, you had a lot to do with experience. developing that technique, though, didn't you? I worked with them, yeah. Oh, sure. And, uh, and for how long? Oh, a year or so. Okay. And then I was offered the uh, position at full time. At Kent. They established it. Uh, the Salerni Collegium Chair of Neurosurgery in the county, and, mm -hmm. uh, with the microscope. By this time, I knew what the microscope, I could visualize many things with the microscope. I knew I had to get out of private practice in order to develop that. So the county hospital had a lot of sick people and a lot of problems, neurosurgical problems, and uh, I, I went over there full time. So when was this? And that, I went to the county in 1961. But I had done, the early surgeries were done at St. Vincent's and Good Samaritan Hospital now, when in was private the, practice. When was with the, the first micro neurosurgical operation? Well, I think I know. Okay. I think it was in August or late summer of 1957. And that was St. At Vincent's at Hospital. St. Vincent's. All right. And what was the case? And I have the pictures, and we're going to turn this into the museum. But I right. was the, the patient's name was Diane Abati. A-B-A-T-E. She was five years old. Uh -huh. And of all things, she had a schwannoma of the seventh nerve that was growing up through the, the uh, temporal fossa into the uh, temporal, well, up through the petrous bone into the temporal fossa. Uh -huh. A uh -huh. real rare bird, if there was. She oh, had a sure. total facial palsy. And uh, because we had practiced the subtemporal extradural approach, I felt pretty comfortable in starting out and went ahead and took it and uh, did the surgery. It really went very well, and amazingly well. And, and it was just a very enthusiastic sort of thing. It and the away. approach to that was? Sub, uh, uh, sub subtemporal, okay. extradural, okay. into the petrous bone, mm -hmm. scooped out the tumor, lost the seventh nerve. It was gone. It was gone. It was, in, well, it was all yeah, the tumor involved. In. And so she had a permanent facial palsy. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I took her over to Children's Hospital to do a hypoglossal facial anastomosis. Mm -hmm. um, it was very difficult to get people to set the microscope up in those times. And the nurses didn't like it. They were worried about contamination. And, 
and we had the we didn't have the turkey bag yet. We had some uh, we had a a thing that looked like a one arm bandit's nightshirt. It it was a, a, a stockinette with the arm piece taken off and slid over the skull. Terribly awkward thing. Anyway, by the time that was set up and the child was asleep, I had already done, identified the seventh nerve, twelfth nerve, done the anastomosis, and the nurse has said, the microscope is ready, doctor. Mm -hmm. So I took the microscope over and I looked at the hypoglossal facial anastomosis, and it was the ugliest thing I have ever seen through the microscope. And so I took it down and I did another anastomosis with a microscope, and you know, and it, it turned out to be a good operation. But I, I think that that I didn't realize how the contrast between microscopic and gross was at that time. And that was really the first case. I remember us talking a long time ago about the fact that you can, they, what the eye can see, the hand can do. If, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You really can. So anyhow, that was kind of the uh, you know the beginnings. And uh, then I started working on aneurysms and, and uh, acoustic tumors. And that's about the time that you uh, came on board. And uh, I, uh, Bob Rand and I did, we decided that it was a, we, we were very interested in acoustic tumors, the both of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't have enough cases to do any kind of investigation or research. So we decided we'd pool our cases. He got a case, I'd go out there and help him at UCLA. Gene didn't particularly approve of this at the time. <laughs> and he would come down and, and help me. And we managed to get 12 cases together, as I, I recall. And I, I, I used know. to close. Yeah. Remember, That's right. Whatever it was. That's, it was a good yeah. Sam or UCLA. And, have, I'd be there closing and, at night. And, and, we were and then I presented those cases at the Western Neurosurgical Society meeting in Montreal, and uh, Vancouver. Okay. You were there. They let you out of the den. We flew back. You were very interested and excited about it. We flew back on the plane together. And you said, boy, I'd really like to learn that. And that's how our relationship began. And you started coming over, and we kind of was, exchanged it things. It was early in my residency. And, uh, yeah. You were, you know, as it happened <coughs> to you, there were, you were one of the important reasons I stayed in neurosurgery. Was that, I don't think it had changed a lot. Well, between when you were a resident and when I was a resident. And that no. they, were, they were doing the best they could. But, you know, the technology had not changed. No one had applied this technology that you brought into neurosurgery. Uh, now, there were other micro neurosurgeons. Well, there, at that time, there was Pete Donahue in Montreal, and there was Leonard Malice in New York, now, a was little Lenny, behind. Lenny wasn't doing Later. He was a little he was later. later. And but, Pete was doing but, experimental stuff. Well, Peter had it going in the laboratory. Sure. And, of course, I'd probably still be in the laboratory if I had one, but I didn't have one at USC. <laughs> and so I had a cadaver room and an operating room, and, and uh, so that sort of launched me early into using the microscope. Now, you had done some cases with House, which were microsurgical mm -hmm. tumor cases, translab. No. No. Never did. Refused. Okay. Would not do one. All right. Some of those cases turned out bad. Mm -hmm. I'm sure of that. He I mean, did it with Jack Doyle and some other mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten who. Well, there was a Kersey and Doyle paper. And then Jack Doyle decided that this was that there was much more to this, and Jack and I wrote up the cases. <clears throat> I don't know what we wrote up. It's, it's published. It's in the Journal of Neurosurgery, and I. Mm -hmm. I it's, it's one of the first it's, papers on. It's one of the early papers. surgery. Uh, That's right. With yeah. the microscope. I presented it at the Cushing meeting in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Frank Mayfield was in the chair. And That's then you didn't ago. publish actually until 1960, which was several well, years after you, you had. Know that I've never had, been a uh, very good publisher. I know that. I know that. <laughs> and, uh, Maybe you'll get a little better we someday. We blamed that on the lack of uh, the right university facilities, et cetera. And here I've been at the University of Pittsburgh three years, and my publications are still pretty scant. They'll, so they'll come. you know they'll whose come. fault it is. We won't let you retire. Anyway. Now, but, uh, there are other people, though. Uh, these were good people. But Pete Donahue was later. He was working in the lab, but he was later. He Lenny was, Malice was later. J. Lawrence Poole. Well, J. Lawrence Poole was editor, as you know, of the Journal of Neurosurgery. And uh, when I, present, I presented uh, this technique at the Houston Neurological Meeting, Bill Fields' Houston Neurological Conference. Okay. And Malcolm Carpenter was there, my old roommate. 
And uh, we talked about this getting into the internal auditory canal uh, from the top side. Uh, Malcolm spent a great amount of his time trying to identify the afferent and the efferent components of, of, of MLF. And of course, there's a big vestibular input to it. And he was doing his degeneration studies on, uh, by opening the posterior fossa in the macaques, uh, peeling back the flocculus, and cutting individually the superior and the inferior vestibular nerves. Okay. But he wasn't getting very clear results you because the flocculus, well, the flocculus is very big in a monkey. Mm -hmm. And so he had to damage the flocculus, and he wasn't really doing an isolated study. Okay. So he saw the fact that we could go in for the temporal okay. fossa, okay. and he said, can you do that in my monkeys? So I said, I don't know. He sent me a whole box of monkey skulls, and I sat at my desk and drilled them out with a microscope. And uh, I thought maybe I could. So I went back to Columbia. And also, I was trying to get Larry Poole interested in my microscope. <laughs> and uh, I went to the lab, and Ben Stein was doing a fellowship in, in uh, Malcolm's lab at the time. And, Mal and Ben learned how to do the microscope mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we, he helped me, actually. And uh, we got uh, the, the uh, vestibular nerves cut in 11 of, of, um, of the monkeys. And uh, a journal has, an article came out in the Journal of Anatomy on, and it, was, it helped a lot in understanding the projection studies. And uh, so that was a, a, an accelerating mm -hmm. thing. What was mm -hmm. good for me about that was is that, you know, you can take a ma macaque monkey skull and set it inside the temporal fossa with room to spare in a human temporal fossa. So I, it was like, once I finished, once I learned how to do that, everything else was kind of easy. Yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> and, that's and a very it, good point. You know, it's like getting ready for a golf tournament and putting to a fruit can rather than a I mean, Then when you get the, the conventional golf hole, it looks like a yawning cam, uh, cavern for your golf hole. Now, anyway. about, what was Poole's uh, well, contribution Poole at just, that time? There was none. He he came out, as you know, and as a, you know, he said that he did the, use the uh, microscope. But he came out to Los Angeles. He saw my work, and he was much more interested in the instruments than he was. Mm -hmm. I had made some mm -hmm. instruments, you know, mm -hmm. those scissors sure. and stuff. You got. Sure. And uh, so Larry was uh, uh, really uh, not exactly a promoter of microsurgery. A lot of guys were. Francis Murphy, uh, and so on. the people who really recognized it for what it was at that time were Frank Mayfield uh -huh. and Colin McCarty. They, did, they, they did both understand. invited me to the Mayo Clinic. I spent a week there, and I spent a week or so in Cincinnati operating on Frank's patients mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. Bert McBride, mm -hmm. and uh, they really saw the potential very. Early. That's interesting, because these people kept open minds right through their careers, which is nice, nice to know. Now, tell me about Joe Witt, who I never met. Okay, I think, I think now, I, I talked to John, I knew we were going to do this thing, and I talked to John Adams the other day. John Adams says that he and Joe, Joe Witt was in the Navy. He was a lieutenant in the Navy. In San Francisco? At, where uh, we? Yeah, what's that place? Treasure Island, uh, uh, the Navy base uh, up there yeah. in the Bay. And Joe Witt uh, was a very young guy, assistant professor full-time at UC Moffitt after uh, John Adams became chairman. John Adams brought him on board. And he had a, I, he was a very likable guy. I never saw him do him. And he and John Adams uh, did one or two cases with a monocular microscope which John says they sterilized with ethylene oxide. And uh, I think that Joe Witt was probably the first real intracranial micro neurosurgeon. But they never published it. He got a lymphoma and died. Yeah. Well before I became a resident. Nurse. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, that was in uh, somewhere around 1956 again. Yeah. So. But technology so was, was coming along. It was and, an idea that yeah. was waiting to 
for its time. You needed the technology, but you also yeah. needed unfettered minds. And you can't have good ideas without, without being able to prove them or disprove them. Yeah, so, that's true. You yeah. know, I, and, and talking about an unfettered mind, and there was, as you well know, there was a lot of resistance to this as a introducing this to the field of neuroscience. Really? <laughs> <laughs> there were people who wouldn't let the microscope in the operating room sure, and sure. so on. But what that's normal, of incidentally. That's a normal process, you know. Yeah, I know that. But but you don't know it when you're young and trying you don't to know it make this happen as you were in 1957. But what I you know, but I've done the same thing as you know. The Renaissance in posterior fossa surgery was when we got into the sitting position. The microscope was a lot of things were important. Mm -hmm. But the, mm -hmm. the being able to do the surgery in a sitting position made an enormous contribution to the advancement of posterior fossa surgery. And a lot of guys are still doing it that way. Oh, sure. uh, but when everybody started putting the patient down, you included, et cetera, being an old goat, I said, no, that's wrong. But I've now come around, uh, and I was very slow to learn that you didn't have to sit up every patient. I still think that it's adv advantageous to do it for the fourth ventricle. I don't think it's a better way to and do I a fourth ventricle. And I think it is for the tumor. acoustics. And I think for big acoustics, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the way it is. And with the new techniques, but, I think yeah. it is for the smaller acoustics. And we'll, well talk about okay. that some other yeah. time. Okay. okay. All right. But and, where do you think we're headed now? We've had the technology that has changed neurosurgery. You were the, the engine. You were the prime mover, as far as I'm concerned, and a lot of people, in applying this technology to neurosurgery. Then came many other things. Anesthesia, the drugs. Anesthesia is a, what a the, the monitoring. Imaging no. situation, monitoring. But these, although they've come in concert, you know, without what you did, I don't think they could have happened. They could have not have been applied as well anyway. Well, you know, in uh, Isaiah, Berlin, Isaiah Berlin's essay called The Fox and the Hedgehog, he discusses this in great detail as to what would happen without the individual who is alleged to have made it happen. <laughs> and there's a, an eternal debate about what, I mean, the microscope was something that was going to happen. I just happened to be there at the right time. Uh, and I'm not diminishing my role or anything like that, but there is a, we have to be careful when we, when we ascribe uh, events to people. I think that, that there's a saying that, that I very believe in, it takes a very unusual mind to do the obvious. <laughs> and, and think about that, I think yeah. you're being very modest because, yeah. Yeah. you know, we don't know how important what we do is, no. or unimportant, what you did I think was very important. I want to ask you one last question before we quit. Where are we headed in neurosurgery? Well, I think we have, I think once again, it's the people. And we have an entirely different breed of young men coming into yeah, the women. field of neurosurgery. And hey, they're all computer literate. They oh. learned this in, as a toy for the most part. Uh, I'm just learning computer work. Uh, these people are now with imaging. They're attracted to the field uh, because they, uh, they it, the kind of a person that's attracted to neurosurgery today is entirely different than the kind of a person that was attracted to it when we were. Because, you know, we really didn't know what we were doing so much of the time. And so many of the decisions we made were so, I mean, they were catastrophic for people. And so the kind of a person who would allow himself, put himself in the position of making those really frightening decisions, taking on those responsibilities with so little information, is an entirely different personality type than, yeah. than, than what we have today, where, you know, we never go looking for the tumor today. We know exactly no, where it is. Our minds are free. Yeah. And so, and, and we have... We're getting down to the molecular level now, and uh, I, I just think it's going to be brighter and brighter, and uh, I'm happy I'm not doing it. <laughs> we shall see. Yeah. It has been uh, a privilege since I first met you to talk with you, just as we have here. And uh, we've always managed to sort of gear each other up and turn each other on over what we have done, the mistakes we've made, learning from them, and, uh, and tomorrow, you know. 
and making today better for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you've been up to for, for a long time, and, and uh, it's nice to share it with you. We've had here a, a conversation with one of the prime movers in neo-neurosurgery, and uh, we are all grateful to Ted Kersey for his contributions and for being the kind of person that uh, he has been, that he is, and as a young man, as he will be. Ted, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Hey. What is that strange thing you have there with you, Dr. Kersey? Well, that's a operating microscope, Dr. Janetta. It looks different and, uh, than uh, that's another one that there. One. You can hardly uh, recognize the two. And uh, as far as I know, this is the first operating room, the first microscope that was ever used for uh, intracranial surgery. When when was that? Well, I think it was in August 1957. I'm not entirely sure. About you don't have the operative note? I don't have the operative note, and uh, it has not been uh, located. I have the name of the patient, but I haven't been able to get the operative note. Right. I've tried. That was at which hospital? St. Vincent's in, in Los Angeles. Angeles. Yeah. In August of 1957. August of 57, I believe, and I think the patient's name was Diane Abate. I have always been interested in the circumstances that brought you to move the microscope across the hall from the laboratory to the operating room. There must have been 500 neurosurgeons who had used the microscope in the laboratory. No one, well, no one thought to use it in the, uh, yeah. in the head, in the patient. What happened with you that made you do this? Well, well there were just barely 500 neurosurgeons. <laughs> At that time, we didn't have a I doubt if they were all playing with a microscope. But what you say is, is substantively true. Um, the, uh, a number of people were using the microscope in the laboratory uh, for various uh, animal uh, uh, exper both experiments. And uh, uh, Dr. Donahue was uh, uh, practicing uh, small blood vessel manipulation, had a laboratory. Dr. Yasagil was uh, studying in that laboratory. That was that was ten years later. And that was uh, that was, 66, that was some actually. years later. That was later. nine years later. That's right. Uh -huh. That was the reason 55, 56. It, it did not require anything for me to take it out of the laboratory and put it in the operating room, because a I didn't have a laboratory. I had tried to get one, and uh, that uh, uh, was not available at the time. I did have an autopsy room, and. Uh, I operated on uh, uh, many cadavers uh, prior to moving to the operating room. Uh, so this was a plan thing. It was not an impulsive thing. No, no. It was very definite. And I'll tell you the circumstances. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, William House was, uh, and it was and is a near nose and foot man in uh, uh, Los Angeles. He uh, rotated through the neurosurgical service at the Los Angeles County General Hospital. And uh, we became friends. He finished his residency. Uh, I interrupted mine for military service, returned. And uh, I listened to Dr. House uh, present a paper at the, uh, one of the local hospitals on uh, middle ear surgery in which he used the microscope. Uh, I was unaware at that, up until that moment that the microscope was available for any surgical procedure. And uh, I, having known Bill, I congratulated him on his paper. And he pointed out to me that he was, the paper was so-so, but it was, there was nothing new about it, uh, that uh, this work had been done by his brother and others. Uh, but I was fascinated with what we could see in the middle ear 
uh, with the operating microscope. It was essentially a vascular. Uh, there was a 16 millimeter film associated with the presentation. I congratulated him, and he said to me, "Well, that's fine, but my this is not my work." He said, "The real challenge uh, is in the inner ear," and uh, he said, "The only way you can get to the inner ear is destroy the middle ear." And he said, "You destroy the middle ear, you might as well not bother to go to the inner ear." And a uh, short time later, I was doing a, a, a spiller fraser uh, rhizotomy uh, that, uh, required, that was done under the temporal lobe uh, and uh, uh, for cutting the uh, gasserian, the root of the gasserian nerve uh, posterior to uh, the ganglion. That was an operation that uh, had a lot of technical, although it was a simple operation and carried out by experienced people, uh, well, it was a procedure that had produced a number of complications and a lot of anecdotes about it, although it was very safe altogether. Uh, one of the uh, uh, problems was identifying the uh, third division of the nerve. Uh, and in the process of doing so, Remember now, the extradural space, uh, bleeding uh, sometimes was there, sometimes it wasn't there, sometimes it was controllable, sometimes it wasn't controllable because it was coming from very small blood vessels. Uh, we had an admonition just to stay way forward, stay way forward when you're looking for the third root. I was doing the surgery and reflecting on Dr. House's statement about not having, finding the, uh, not having access to the uh, internal elements of the ear, or the auditory apparatus, and it occurred to me that the reason we stayed forward is we didn't want to pull on the greater superficial petrosal nerve, which was uh, attached to the, to the uh, geniculate ganglion attached to the seventh nerve. And seventh nerve palsy was a hazard of this surgical procedure. It then occurred to me that this is where Dr. House wanted to go. I had absolutely no idea what he wanted to do there. And, uh, Time. And so I got together with him and demonstrated this approach, which was subtemporal, uh, we call it subtemporal extradural uh, approach to the internal auditory canal. In the cadaver? In the cadaver, right. This was all done in the cadaver. And uh, he was rather impressed with that, and, on the, and, and both of us uh, dissected for some time. Uh, in this technique, we drilled off the top of the petrous uh, bone over the internal auditory canal, developed access to the canal from the top side. Uh, during the course of that extradural exposure, I began to realize what the potential was for the microscope, because there was no such thing as extradural oozing. Uh, with the microscope, you could see the blood vessels, and you could see even the tiniest vein or artery from which the blood was coming. And so it was an operation that frequently had a problem, an occasional problem with blood loss, uh, was converted into uh, an avascular uh, dry field. Uh, and then I began to think about that a little bit more, and I thought, wow, how about aneurysms and other uh, surgeries? So, uh, Dr. House and I parted company uh, when I became full-time at the University of Southern California or the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center, and I began a regular series of dissections. The initial elements in developing this uh, were largely logistical. That is, how to get the microscope into the operating field and preserve sterility, uh, how to uh, maneuver the microscope when it was there, uh, and uh, this was uh, absorbed a great deal of our uh, attention. A third element was uh, the fact that we uh, needed instrumentation that fit the size of the field and the, the magnification that we were looking at. Uh, and so I spent a great deal of time making instruments, grinding large instruments down, uh, and uh, the other thing we had difficulty doing, and I think one of the major, and I still think one of the most essential elements 
in successful microsurgery is the uh, manipulation of a self-retaining uh, or utilization of self-retaining retractor. What point did you... Uh, initially, you we didn't have a self-retaining retractor. I want to go back to the microscope again, but show us the original retractor that you used. Uh, well, this is the... Well, the original retractor that we used was essentially like a modification of what is now called the Janetta retractor, uh, which was a modification of that. But this, this, which was a simplification of this, and you can certainly understand why Dr. Janetta wanted to simplify this, but uh, I don't know if we have a Janetta retractor to show. That's not, that's not important. That's not important. That's contemporary nonsense. Uh, this is history. It's more important. But this uh, was uh, what I obtained from uh, the uh, company's name was uh, Allen and Hanbury Limited, England. And it was made to order. And it's a series of a, a retractor system. Uh, consisting of a drill, which drilled a, a hole in the bone, exactly the right size. Uh, and then we had these posts uh, here they are, that we would screw into that hole on the edge of the craniotomy, just crank this in. And then with the post fixed in there, we would then apply these little fellas and a series of arms, something like a complex erector set or more commonly known today as a Lego, only it's not plastic. And uh, you could put a series of these together and uh, then there was this wide variety of retractors which would go on the end. And uh, they permitted a freely moving retractor. Uh, the pressure was ratio was one to one. That was the, the ratio of the surgeon's hand. And it could be locked into place very effectively by these little uh, locks. And you could move it, and it would hold. And you could move it, put it where you wanted it. Your assistant would tighten it, and it would hold. It was very precise. And it was. It was very precise and accurate, except as you can see, it was pretty complex. You didn't need most of them, and we you didn't used need, <laughs> you didn't need about a third of these things. Uh, but over time, that's the way we mm -hmm. used it. Um, now, Dr. Janetta came along, and he developed a retractor, oh, that's, uh, which that's... was a spreading retractor with, one, with a small blade attached to it, which is still used effectively today. Well, but the, the important thing here was precision of, of movement and precision of holding the thing. And, so, and then he had instruments, which we, we don't have here. Instruments are the jeweler's instruments, and they've long uh, gotten uh, uh, off into entropy, I'm sure. Uh, I developed a number of other instruments that went along with it. We needed, uh, most people who have had training in general surgery know that uh, uh, the Metzenbaum scissor curve scissor has sort of a magic uh, character to it for dissection, and we badly needed one of those, and uh, so we had the uh, Metzenbaum scissors conventionally cut down to smaller size for use in the microscope. Uh, we covered the microscope initially with a turkey bag, bought at the local plastic turkey bag, bought at the local grocery store, and uh, we had here this light. Out, show it to you. But here's the bulb system that was used for the light. And uh, this would burn out two or three times during the course of a surgical procedure. It required undoing the turkey bag. But it is very long procedures. So. And, and the procedures were long. And I'm going to show you one of the reasons why they were so long. And uh, there was sort of an art to getting this back together, which I've since lost. I, 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 I used to be very good at these. Here's where it goes. It's a triangle and a triangle. And it goes like there you that. go. There it goes. I'll learn. Uh, so that the turkey bag would have to be taken off with the belt bow burned down, uh, replaced, this taken off and replaced. Uh, another problem that occurred was that this was a very hot bow and it was 
was inside this heavy plastic bag, and uh, after a while, uh, it would uh, occasionally it would start to smoke inside the bag. <laughs> it was a bit of uh, you know it caused a bit of concern. We eventually uh, got a little micro fan and a heat pump and a and a hose that went out the top to, to, to change the air, and that too added to the complexity. But the major thing that we had was the problem of maneuverability. As you know, the head is sort of round, and the approaches to various compartments of the brain require quite a bit of maneuvering and manipulating. So uh, let me just show you what you have to do, what, one would, what we had to do uh, in order to move the microscope. This uh, had to be loosened. This had to be loosened. This had to be loosened. This had to be loosened a little bit. <laughs> and, and then the microscope would be moved up and down and anchored into position uh, here. Uh, we had a, there's a spring on here, a counterbalancing spring, uh, and these uh, devices were made depending upon, uh, were introduced later when we had a camera. This was for a camera which we didn't have initially. But uh, this system really hardly ever balanced. And uh, we then began to, this instrument was used for years. Uh, and finally, I, we were able to convince the uh, Zeiss company that uh, we needed something more for neurosurgery. Because you can just imagine trying to move this and keep it in clear focus a uh, hundred or more times during a procedure. When I was in uh, Zurich with Yasser Gill, uh, sitting on that famous bench in back of him, uh, I had, he was doing an anterior communicating artery aneurysm with uh, the fir earliest version of this instrument. And I had a little check thing. And every time he moved the microscope, I put a little check on a piece of paper. And over the course of time, he moved the microscope well over 200 times. Well, just imagine going through this process uh, over 200 times. It was very clumsy and uh, very inadequate. Uh, the other thing we learned uh, in this is that we, this, uh, the, the uh, objective that's on here is a 200 millimeter objective. And uh, so it had to be held pretty close to the surface. The 200 millimeters was just fine for eye and ear surgery where uh, there wasn't a very great depth neurosurgery, sometimes the focus of the procedure would be five centimeters beyond the surface of the skull. So that would bring the 200 millimeter microscope virtually down, <coughs> nearly in contact with the skull. And sometimes it was difficult to get instruments in and out of the field. So a series of objectives up to 300 millimeters were developed so that we could move the microscope away from the uh, did I miss anything? Here? How responsive was the uh, company to change? Terrible. And they remain so, I think. Yeah, I unfortunately don't have anything to do with them anymore. Now, now we had but, now Mark Harrison, our engineer, is here. Mark, what kind of a light are we using, using in there now? The uh, present light that we're using in the, uh, the new microscope is a xenon bulb, which is a very high intensity bulb. The wattage is something in the, in the range of about 200, 250 watts. The bulb uh, that is in the old microscope is uh, with a 40-watt bulb. So the light intensity today is much more intense than, than uh, the original scope. Thank you. See, it's also sun. delivered through a fiber optic cable. Right. And of course, we didn't have that resource. We had the bulb contained uh, in the microscope. There's a there's a a new discipline of taking the care and feeding of these instruments oh, now, yeah. which you this, all did I mean, this by yourself. Special. This is such a beautiful thing. A and, team uh, of engineers do what you do. Uh, if you can play the camera on the, I don't know if you can do the TV on the TV, but there is a beautiful focus there of George Washington. Uh, it's almost his birthday. And Abraham Lincoln, and it is his and birthday. Abraham Lincoln, it is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple. And I, what I'll do, do you have a good focus on it now? What I'll do is I'll take it out of focus. and. And, and I'll put it back in, and without trying very hard, I've got it right back. It's so simple as compared to uh, rustling this around. Um, 
my shoulders used to get so tired from wrestling this around that I learned in order to not affect my surgical judgment, although I think it was frequently affected, is that I developed an exercise for myself that I did every morning. I did 400 of these little things, uh, hard as fast as I can go and hard this way, to keep my shoulders from, from just uh, screaming uh, during the surgical procedure. Uh, so we had a fair amount of uncooperation, from a uh, lack of it, from the Zeiss company. Uh, they were selling them as fast as they could make them, I think. That was part of it. And they were selling them so fast, and, and, and uh, they just uh, weren't too interested in our problem. But uh, uh, finally, they became interested as their sales yeah. went up. And I told them, uh, Yasegel and I both told them that there was a better way to do this, and we needed a system that was much more mobile. Uh, they brought out another uh, microscope, uh, which is not here, but uh, happily, uh, but this system was even more cumbersome than this system. And so I had done sort of a systems engineering design uh, for a, uh, what is, this is called a contravis unit. And the contravis is a, is, was a company that uh, uh, functioned during World War II. They principally made uh, anti-aircraft guns. I, I have been told, I have no evidence that they sold them to both sides. And uh, uh, they, uh, but they had a, the ability to move optics with a great amount of precision. And uh, one of uh, Dr. Yasegil's acquaintances, a man by the name of Hans Velmy, V-O-E-L-M-Y, uh, met with us and we discussed uh, uh, the uh, possibility Travis coming to our aid in developing a more mobile unit than what we had. And uh, he went to his company, and the company, uh, the report I got back was that they didn't think this was a saleable product, uh, but because their uh, employees were always uh, involved in destruction, uh, they thought that it might be good for company morale if they could do something that would have something to do with helping people. And so that's how the contrabas uh, was uh, developed. Now, Peter, you've got something there. Well, the before that, I want to, one of the gnomes in this uh, factory used to paint the prism system, which changes the magnification. And you never knew whether the edge of the prism system was painted or not. And I have learned from Ted how to, I can't get that out of there. Yeah, It'll how to eventually. change to take the paint out of the system so you get enough light in the scope. Now, that was okay working by yourself. You could see barely well enough. The big problem, however, was, is what I wanted to get into next, yeah. was the question of sharing what you saw with others. Now, initially, I've, and I've, as a resident across town, I worked with you yes. with this microscope. And I'm sure it brought back great, uh, wonderful, interesting feelings oh, yeah. to you. As a matter of fact, when we, we had to uh, ferret this microscope out of a research laboratory in Pasadena where it had been relegated. And uh, we had quite a, quite a struggle in getting it here. And, and uh, it's going to go on permanent exhibit uh, in the uh, Cushing uh, Museum uh, uh, archives. Uh, but it came, in t when it finally arrived here, it came in two large boxes. And uh, I uh, disconnected, I assembled this uh, myself. Some people wonder, worried whether I could put it together or not, and I really did know how to put this together. Uh, as a matter of fact, while I was putting it together and assembling it for this uh, little uh, show, uh, I, my pulse rate kept getting faster and faster, and I kept getting angrier and angrier. And there wasn't anything for me to be angry on, and I really couldn't figure out what it was that was upsetting me so much. What it was was that my limbic system uh, was still active and remembering the frustration and agony I used to go through getting this ready for surgery. The nurses didn't want it in the operating room. I had to borrow it overnight from an ear, nose, and throat uh, lab to get it. And I had to carry it in my wife's station wagon, and she didn't want me to have the station wagon. And so it was a very, <laughs> it was, it was a very frustrating experience putting this thing together. And I probably did that 50 or 100 times and I had to wheel it into the hospital, and in as much as I was a low-ranking person in the institution,
institution. My car was parked a long way away from the entrance to the hospital, so I had to get out of the car, assemble the, the, the scope on the stand, and uh, wheel it down to the hall to the entrance to the hospital. And uh, by the time I got to the operating room to do the case, I was a, you know, I was a physical and mental wreck. Uh, even getting it down here today, I moved it down on the elevator, and, and I, uh, my, uh, I think the back of my neck flared up a fair amount of time. I was moving <laughs> it down. It was just an unbelievably cumbersome thing to be carrying around town. Tell me about Jack Urban and and the whole system of of sharing your findings with others. It's thirty-five millimeter camera, and I've uh, put uh, before 16, you sixteen. And I put before you the sixteen millimeter movie camera. Right. Right. But both both things were uh, at least adapted by him. It's not developed. Jack, by him. Because Zeiss was very uncooperative, this is a very bad advertisement. I'm not angry at them anymore, but but uh, it does tell us a lot about the history of this. Uh, uh, they just didn't seem to be very responsive to things that we wanted to do. There are many anecdotes about this. Uh, but uh, Jack Urban was a local uh, instrument, uh, optical instrument person in, the, in Burbank. And uh, I took Jack the problem, and Jack was thoughtful enough uh, to go ahead and make adaptations. He finally made an adaptation of the OPM. This is called the OPM-1 microscope. It still is. And then he, in turn, uh, developed a camera, which is called the urban camera, which would ad adapt uh, onto here. Not onto this one, of course, because it, it's not set up for it. Uh, and that set up a whole new, it was a, it was a it was a way to record what we were seeing through the microscope. And that was terribly important because the responses we were getting from our colleagues was that we have good eyes and we don't need the microscope. And so when we were able to demonstrate in film clinical uh, exposures of aneurysms and other pathology showing the seventh nerve in the cerebellopontine angle and so on, uh, people were really convinced that we had something while. Uh, but uh, what happens when you, when you add the camera to the beam splitter, it takes half the light. So the demand, so we were, we were, had a poor light to begin with by comparison to what we have now. But in addition to that, we took half of it away every time we wanted to make a film. So this then led to our developing a, a rheostat that we press, and there were about 18 different buttons on the floor to regulate things. Another one was added where you stepped on it to increase, uh, goose the light source so that you could take film. And of course, you couldn't do that very often because then the bulb would burn out sooner. And then we got a higher intensity bulb, and it was just one series of things piggybacking uh, uh, on one another. Um, and so I think that probably worthwhile to keep this around and show it to people because the younger generation think that this is microsurgery and this is microsurgery happily today, but it certainly is not uh, microsurgery uh, as it started out. It was quite a struggle. The thing that uh, I think is important and is not even thoroughly recognized by all people today and that is that when uh, the microscope is used, uh, we forget that it's just more than magnification and light. Because the average uh, interpupillary distance for the human is uh, 6.2 centimeters. Uh, you can see that in the uh, if we can take the, I don't know if you I can be able off. to see this I or not. I can get this off. Really? But if you look right in here, you'll see that the objective interpupillary distance, there being two objectives in here, two lens there systems, is, I don't know if you can focus in on that yes, sir. or not, but in there, there are two Raise little. It up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Okay, now look at it. There we go. I'll get this out of the, the way. The light's not good enough for you to see. I don't know if you can get right in there or not. But 
There are two lenses. Your head's in the way of the light. Well, yeah, yeah. in there. And uh, they are approximately uh, 2.1 centimeters apart. And they make it possible with the beam splitter to have binocular three dimensional depth perception. In a narrow now, space. Most, pardon? In a narrow space. In a narrow space. Now, most, in a, in a much narrower space than you would have with your eyes in addition to the light source, because what you can focus with your eyes, but as you focus with your eyes, you actually have to bring the field nearer to you. You can't cross your eyes out here. So it has to come close to you. So this gives you an opportunity to see through a narrow hole and have binocular vision. But most intracranial neurosurgery uh, is done through a slit or a slot that's created uh, by the surgeon with a retractor lifting the brain away from the skull, like so. And so, but, and the slit is usually in one direction or another. And if you, even with the microscope uh, objectives as they are uh, reduced, you can get, you can see very well through a, a half a centimeter or a centimeter uh, slit of retraction and have perfect vision. If the microscope, however, is line of line is perpendicular to the eyepieces down here, then you have to increase the size of that twice as much. And it does increase the amount of retraction. And uh, uh, the, this degree of maneuverability uh, provides an opportunity for sort of an unlimited uh, uh, developing the scope into the uh, slot uh, that's the easiest way. And uh, it's just nothing to put it there. There is even an adaptation that goes on here uh, for a mouthpiece. And you can have a mouthpiece, looks like a clothespin, uh, go in your mouth through your mask. And you can actually maneuver. There are many people, Yasser Gill, John Tu, a lot of people use this uh, as a means of keeping the microscope in constant focus. But with this adaptation, it's so easy to do, so simple, that uh, I think very few people actually use that. Me. Uh, but keeping the microscope parallel to that slot is very, very important <coughs> in, in getting, <coughs> getting exposure without too much retraction. Did you meet resistance early on from people when you started, neurosurgeons now, when you started to use the microscope, doing things that had been done before? Oh, yeah. That's not even talking about new things yet. Oh, sure. Was it age group related? Definitely age related. Uh, one of my very dear friends, Francis Murphy, and I remember the first exhibit that I had showing the use of the microscope at the American College of Surgeons meeting in Chicago. Uh, I was setting up my exhibit the day before the meeting, and uh, Francis Murphy came by. And we'd always been good pals. He'd always been nice to me. He looked at what I was doing and studied me for a while, and he said, what in the world is that? Well, that's a microscope. And he said, what are you doing with that? I said, well, we're doing surgery. And he said, what a foolish thing to do. He said, it must be something to matter your eyes. Go out and get a pair of glasses or some other smart track. And uh, the, uh, I think the meeting was at the Palmer House. And it was right across the street from uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. And he said, instead of wasting your time on that, he said, they've got a couple of really brand nifty uh, old uh, fly rods that are going out of style for fly fishing. He said, go on over there and buy one before they're all gone. <laughs> be much more important than what I was doing with the microscope. It was a great source of uh, fun to me. Uh, many years later, like two or three years later, uh, half of the instrumentation exhibits uh, at the meetings were on the microscope. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Francis was there setting up the microscope some sort of a microsurgical exhibit for his uh, group in Tennessee. And uh, uh, Francis came looking for me, and he said, tell me how you set this bloody thing up. <laughs> so it gave me a great deal of pleasure to go and help him uh, uh, assemble it. Um, uh, a 
uh, Larry Poole had come out to look at my work, and, and I was trying to con him into getting an article in the Journal of Neurosurgery. And, um, and uh, he thought that his, my instruments were fascinating, but he, he felt that he had good eyes. He said, I have good eyes. I don't need the microscope. I think all the older generation and, good neurosurgeons were, were yeah. myopic and had natural magnification. Well, I think so, too. You know, I, as you and I have known in a conversation that we had in the laboratory when you were thinking about what you were going to do, uh, I pointed out that what I had done so far was not original at all. It had all been uh, done by Walter Dandy or described by Dandy, but no one else seemed to have seen it except Dandy, and I think people challenged uh, uh, Dandy's integrity at times. And uh, I just found with the microscope that what Walter Dandy was talking about was, was absolutely true. And uh, we, we could find it. Um, uh, that was the, the fifth nerve. And Peter started to work on the fifth nerve. And had a great uh, lot of fun discovering that. Uh, so the, uh, Dandy made a statement that if anyone was ever going to preserve the seventh nerve in uh, acoustic tumor surgery, uh, they would have to start the dissection at the lateral extremity of the internal auditory canal. Turned out to be right. But how did Dandy know that? I really don't know. Because he certainly didn't see at any time the lateral extremity of the internal auditory canal. We drilled it out with the microscope. So that uh, there are many, many things that, that uh, came up. But, uh, well, I'm running out of gas. Uh, oh, you're not going to run out of gas. We have two more minutes here. I'm going to ask so, you more questions. But uh, certainly we did verify. Sit down for a minute. I have a couple more. Sit down? Sure. All right. Uh, thing might off. bite I don't want you all the bad out things out. I've said about it. I want you to run out of gas. Sit down for a minute. I have some questions to ask you. When do you think uh, the corner turned as far as acceptance of the neurosurgical <laughs> community uh, of the microscope as a reasonable instrument for a neurosurgeon to be acquainted with and to use comfortably? How long did that well, take? The there was a very sharp curve. <laughs> and it all occurred. UCLA, uh, when Bob Rand and I put together a conference on uh, the introduction of the microscope. And uh, we invited uh, uh, 200 people, and 200 people came. There was not an empty seat in the room. We have photographs from all of that, and we hope one day that it will be incorporated in a permanent uh, Cushing uh, exhibit. And uh, a lot of uh, people who are now department chairmen and very well established people were hardly shaving yet when, when this was done. It was, uh, I, I think it was 1972, but I'm not really sure. 67. 67. February, I think. Yeah. It was shortly and after I finished my training and, and uh, I came back. To okay, that. yes, you were months, at LSU. A few oh, months after I left. Anyway, uh, we presented a whole bunch of uh, uh, things. Uh, um, uh, Jim Smith, James Smith, who was a hand surgeon in New York, and uh, he was doing acute anastomoses of peripheral nerves that were cut in uh, industrial accidents. Um, uh, Harry Bunky was sewing rabbits, changing rabbits' ears and changing them around. Uh, Yassergill was there, and uh, uh, Bob Rand made a presentation. Peter made a Do you remember what you talked about? No, but I had the program floating around somewhere, I think. Anyway, and, and after that meeting, that meeting was held about a week before the Cushing meeting in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. and, in, and I had been going to instrument makers trying to get them to think about making some instruments that would help us. And uh, people kept going to the various uh, uh, booths in San Francisco and saying, God, where can we get some, you know, some of these instruments mm -hmm. similar to the ones that we had developed for our own purposes? They received orders, I think, for almost $200,000 worth of instruments at the meeting. They were ecstatic. They didn't have the instruments, but they took the order anyway. They still do that. Sure. <laughs> they take orders for instruments, and then they, they deliver them to you a year later. What about, what about your leaving the chairmanship at Southern Cal? Was that related to your being tired of all you had done and the lack of acceptance of it, or, or would you rather not say anything about it? No, I... Uh, 
you know, the, the department at USC expanded enormously. We had the responsibility for Children's Hospital. We had the responsibility for Rancho Las Amigas, that uh, entire uh, spinal cord injury center. Uh, and it, it was becoming a, an administrative burden. And I was really just a surgeon, and uh, I liked the patients, I liked the surgery, and uh, all of a sudden I was going to too many lunches, and uh, I, I didn't, and I was uh, handing out Kleenex in the office to people who were unhappy, and, and, and that wasn't something I wanted to do. But the departments were so large, and you know about this, <laughs> that you have to spend a fair amount of time doing that. So I, and I was eligible for retirement. I also thought I had a, a good successor in the name of Marty Weiss, who did succeed me. And sometimes when the chairman steps down precociously, he has some influence on who will succeed him. And, uh, then I went out and did private practice for almost 10 years mm -hmm. and, uh, and enjoyed it very much. Uh, How about your sabbatical? You spent, I wondered, I've always wondered, and I've always wanted to ask you uh, why you spent a sabbatical doing, when, when that was, and why you spent that time doing what you did. You mean the humanity, humanity study? Uh, philosophy. You studied Greek philosophy. philosophy. Well, I studied the humanities. A lot of it was Greek philosophy. Um, well, I think that it is true uh, for surgeons in general and for neurosurgeons especially uh, that, and particularly in those days when we had so little information based, to base our decisions on. And uh, we can remember pretty well sometimes what we did right, but uh, there's a dark, bleak period in the past where we made a lot of mistakes and we did things wrong and other people paid for our mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They weren't real mistakes, but they were the best we could do. It was the best we could do. And I found that uh, uh, psychologically or emotionally very disturbing. And uh, I uh, had to always convince myself that I knew I was right in the decisions that I made for doing surgery or the intraoperative decisions. But what was uh, in the lonely times, very, very disturbing for me uh, was the fact that most of the time I knew I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, that was distressful. It uh, had a profound effect, I think, on my own personal behavior and response. And uh, uh, I more or less retreated to St. John's College in Santa Fe for the sabbatical, uh, not so much to study the humanities, but to just get away and, and think it all out. And as I began reading the humanities, uh, I realized that, uh, that Kant and St. Augustine and uh, all these people that we uh, think about as the intellectual giants of our time, and there were many, uh, as I read these people in the original and had instruction at St. John's from scholars, that uh, they didn't really know what they were doing either. <laughs> the great source. <laughs> And I think it helped me a great deal. And, and then I continued my studies in philosophy and in the humanities. And uh, instead of uh, martinis or uh, some other recreation, I found that if I curled up with a philosophy book, I felt a great deal of uh, contentment from it. Do you now feel that you know what you're doing? No, 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 no. I'd never make that. I, I'm afraid of people who really know what they're doing. I, I'm scared of that. But, <laughs> but I think that I don't. I don't have the certainty that I once had. Do you, do you uh, worry that you don't have the certainty? I think you seem a relative. Well, it's an amazing thing. And I don't know if this ought to go with the camera or not, but uh, when I was uh, uh, 10 or 15 years younger than you, uh, I was very certain about a lot of things. Uh, you know, we could read most of the neurosurgical literature at that time and be pretty familiar with what was in it. I don't think I could cover a tenth of the neurosurgical, pertinent neurosurgical literature today. Mm -hmm. So there was a period in my life where I th knew what was going on in neurosurgery and I was reasonably acquainted with, with the rest of the world of neurosurgery. And so I was very certain and it was very frustrating that nobody seemed to pay any attention to me when I knew what should be done and, and I was sure of it. Uh, now as I uh, approach uh, senility, I, 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 I'm very uncertain about most things 
And everybody kind of wants to know what my, what my opinion about things, now that I don't know anything about it. So uh, that's a kind of a awesome experience. But how do, how do you feel about having, in a, in a sense, in a major way, turned around a field? I mean, there, there are about three different things that really change neurosurgery so that a normally sensitive human being, and you're at least normally sensitive, I think you're more than normally sensitive, a normally sensitive human being can practice neurosurgery and have a good life on it and not have to be the kind of person that we know existed for many years in this field. That must feel pretty good to you. That does feel good. And converting uh, the surgical experience, not only the operating room surgical experience, but the uh, preoperative decision uh, into deliberate, relatively knowledgeable uh, areas of decision making, I think is, is, is marvelous. Uh, there are still many uncertainties, as we know. For instance, here, watching the monitoring people work is a real thrill. And that, you know, we, we would spend 15 or 20 hours in the operating room working on the patient, and then the patient would take 15 or 20 hours to wake up. And during that period of time, <laughs> we had no idea how they were going to turn out. Yeah. And uh, that, I think, is attracting an entirely different kind of, of medical scientist to the field today than, than, than you know, I don't know. I, I, it's different. It's different. It's, better. it's a different field. It's really better. better. And yeah. I think the patients are better served. Anything else you want to tell me? Oh, I want to tell you how much fun this has all been. Uh, I, I want to say that how uh, I, I cannot say enough about the program here. And, uh, and if any of you are uh, thinking about when you get around to retiring, Peter, uh, I suggest that you go to somebody else's shop, have no surgical or clinical responsibility for a year or two, and just <laughs> stick your head up out of the ground and look around and see how it is. Because you do have a different point of view. Not a bad one, but it's just a different way of looking at what you used to do. And that's been a great privilege for me, and I want to thank you for it. You're welcome. It's been a privilege for me. And uh, maybe you'll write a paper about it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this has been a conversation with uh, Theodore Kersey, the uh, first micro neurosurgeon, the man who had the uh, courage, and it didn't seem like courage to him, it just seemed like a, a normal thing to do. Uh, to take the microscope into the operating room theater. It's now commonplace, and things that are new either become normal or they disappear. And this is certainly one of the few things in neurosurgery that have changed our lives and, more importantly, the lives of our patients uh, tremendously uh, over the last 30 years uh, to make neurosurgery a nice place to live and work.